Uh, my role is to lead the, the technological development of uh, brain computer interfaces and in, uh, of implantable brain computer interfaces uh, in Neuronica together with the CEO. And uh, in particular, we are targeting Parkinson's disease and um, we are targeting the um, application of adaptive brain stimulation, which is based on a, an implantable pass generator, uh, which is able to record local fee potential, uh, clean local fee potential from stimulation artifact, um, process local fee potential, extract a kind of biomarker of the patient's clinical state, and then adapt in real time the stimulation amplitude or in general, the stimulation parameters uh, accordingly to the patient's clinical state. Um, what I'm going to present to you today uh, are the challenges that uh, we face during our uh, long clinical translate, uh, translational process. It started in 2005. Um, at the time, uh, the CEO of Neuronica, Lorenzo Rossi, together with Professor Alberto Priori, uh, discovered a method for um, cleaning the local fee potential from the stimulation artifact. They patented this method and uh, they also developed a force device for doing uh, this operation and they started to conduct several um, basic research studies in order to collect information about uh, the interaction between uh, stimulation and local fee potentials. In 2011, between 2011 and 2012, we develop an external prototype um, in order to test closed loop the brain stimulation in Parkinson's disease. Thanks to this external prototype, we have been able to conduct three uh, pilot studies. And the first prototype was just uh, a single channel for recording and a single channel for stimulation. And then a second version was converted to dual channel stimulation and dual channel recording. And um, <clears throat> Thanks uh, to the data that uh, we have collected uh, with the external device, uh, we have been able to raise money to develop an implantable device based on our uh, clinical experience and know-how accumulated over time. And uh, this year in 2020, we are approaching the clinical investigation with the implantable device. So let me provide you a picture of our technology and now we are going to use this. Um, the core of the technology, of course, is the HIPG. The HIPG uh, is a, an implantable pass generator uh, that, in our case, is also able to record signal process in a process it internally and uh, also adapt the stimulation. But moreover, this device has also a wireless interface to transmit data outside because the problem of the data management is uh, fundamental in the design of a brain computer uh, interface. And in parallel, we are also developing and is developing a web platform using a FHIR standard, which is an HL7 standard for the management of uh, biometric and clinical data. This will allow in the long term the interoperability of the data. Um, so this is the technology that uh, we have developed it see now. Um, but for providing you a picture of the challenges that we faced from starting in 2005 and uh, arriving today, nowadays in 2020, um, I want to provide a, a four main uh, concept regarding the closed loop neurostimulation system. And you know that any kind of BCI or closed loop neurostimulation system has at least four elements uh, that uh, have to be designed. Uh, one is the sensing technology, then is the algorithm for processing and control stimulation, then there is the stimulation technology, and uh, finally, the, uh, something to manage the data in terms of storing internally the, inform the information or transmitting outside this information. And uh, for each of this block, I will touch what have been the main challenges for the technological development and what and how these um, technological features of the device impacted finally on the clinical application 
and how the clinical application reversely suggested the requirements for designing the clinical, uh, the technical aspect of the device. The main problem of this kind of application, in particular for closed loop deep brain stimulation devices, is sensing, is targeting a signal having an amplitude in the order of less one microphone when the stimulation artifact is in the order of hundreds of millivolts. So there is huge difference between the magnitude of these two signals. And we face this problem, and uh, these are on the right two pictures showing the result. Then I will go to the explanation of the method and the solution that we found this kind of problem. But as you can see, we reached a system able to record a signal in which even during stimulation on or during stimulation off, the amplitude of the signal doesn't change and you can see that there are not artifacts. In the same way, in the frequency domain, if you look at this, the same signal, the frequency domain, uh, what we, we will see that there are not spurious os oscillations in the frequency range that we are interested in, and that during stimulation on, there is also, uh, in this case, in this particular patient, a desynchronization of the activity in the low beta band, which is between 12 and 20 hertz about. This data has been collected in vivo with the, extern with the external prototype, with an external prototype having the same recording circuit of the IPG. Let's now go to the technical solution that we found. Just to recap, what we do, consider that this is the DBS um, electrode, the DBS lead, having four contacts, four macro electrodes. And uh, the idea is that while you provide simulation from one contact, for example, in monopolar configuration, then you can select other two contacts to record the local field potential uh, in a differential mode. Um, and what you can do is also not having a, a, a symmetric configuration with respect to the stimulation contact, but you can also having a, an asymmetric configuration. The general idea is that the spectral content of the narrow signal is completely different from the spectral content of the stimulation. And if you look uh, at the signal during deep brain stimulation in the frequency domain, you will see that uh, the harmonics of uh, the stimulation will be a, a repetition at the frequency of stimulation. And uh, what you can do and what we do is to use a low pass filter to selectively suppress stimulation harmonic and recover uh, the target information, which is the neural signal, in our case, the beta oscillatory activity. This method uh, is uh, described in uh, Rossi et al. in 2007 and also in patent owned by uh, Neuronica. And uh, the problem of recording the type of stimulation artifact has been um, face it also in different times, in different ways. And uh, there are um, more than one solution for processing uh, the data and achieving um, a stimulation artifact cancellation from the signal. Uh, I propose this slide because it's a, a really good uh, technical implementation uh, proposed in 2019 on a publication on author by Thu and uh, colleagues. And uh, this is, is targeting brain computer interface, in particular, cortical brain computer interface, which is a slightly different application compared to a deep application targeting the basal ganglia. Um, and I want to highlight, compared to this application, what are the different uh, methodologies for doing exactly the same jobs. In this case, the methods consist in having a nine uh, input range. That means that you can enter with the stimulation artifact without suffering 
the uh, recording chain and then using software and not only hardware to remove the stimulation hardware. And in this case, software means doing a linear interpolation. And how does it work? It works because there is a, always a coordination between the sampling and the stimulator. And it means that uh, when the ADC sample the signal, the ADC and the microcontroller implementing software linear interpolation knows exactly what sample is corresponded to the stimulation. And because he knows that, he perform a linear interpolation of the samples that are around the stimulation article. And they prove that it works on a, a, a brain computer uh, interface application on cortex in monkeys and by using um, microelectrodes by providing a small amount of current around 160 microampere and maximum provided 8 millivolt. Uh, in this case, it works, but in a deep brain uh, and computer interface, it may not work because of the huge artifact uh, that uh, is provided in a common mode, which is in the order of volt. And here we are still in the order of 8 millivolt. So there are different solutions depending on the specific application and the specific target. And uh, its solutions has its uh, cons and uh, pro, of course. But what I want to highlight by providing this example is that the main challenge that we had was to develop a sensing circuit which is stimulation agnostic. What does it mean? It means that uh, our sensing chip has to work with any kind of stimulation wafer. And this thing is not possible if the method for removing the stimulation artifact is based on a coordination between the sampling and between the stimulation. What does it mean? Let's say that this is the local presentation and the green dots are the sampling of the signal. While uh, in this line, we have the stimulation. What happens in this case? That uh, if you provide a stimulus and you know when there is the stimulus, what you can do is to interpolate the samples or sampling where there is not stimulation or blanking the input of the recorded circuits. But this was not what we look at for, also because these methods works as long as the stimulation waveform uh, is constrained in time. And this may happen only if uh, the active, uh, if the return of charge in the anodic phase is uh, actively control it. What does it mean? Uh, in all the stimulation of the neural tissue, of course, you have to provide a charge balance uh, stimulus in order to avoid the damage of the electron or the neural tissue. And you can do this in two ways, or providing actively the current or using uh, capacitors to um, injecting the charge into the tissue to return the, the charge into the tissue. But when you use a capacitor, the, the release of the charge will have a time cost and dependent on the property of, of the electron. So you cannot control the spread of the wafer over the signal. And this is, um, is another thing that uh, you have uh, really to take in account when uh, you are using a certain kind of uh, uh, technology. Another main problem is where we start for designing a control logic for Parkinson's disease. We started from a really robust results in uh, uh, Parkinson's disease in the, uh, in, in the literature. Uh, that is, the, there have been a lot of observation about how the beta band power changes and is linear uh, correlated to the patient's clinical state, in particular, when the modulation of the beta power and the modulation of the clinical state 
is driven by local fuel potentials. So what we decided to do was to create an algorithm able to adjust the stimulation amplitude in a linear fashion compared to the um, to a range of uh, power of the uh, beta band and uh, the maximum the minimum amplitude have been defined as the therapeutic window of the patient while the maximum um, power the beta band was the power that the, a Parkinsonian patient show in a, a off condition while the minimum is generally the power sh uh, shows shown in a on condition okay um, but uh, what is the mathematical that is behind the algorithm and what is is rational and, um, and what is the processing yeah. imagine that you have an article an artifact free local field potential recorded with the um, your sensing technology. Then the algorithm that we implemented um, cut the signal in a window, perform a, a fast Fourier transform of the signal, and then employ a really uh, slow smoothing of the amplitude in order to decrease the variance of the estimation and uh, decrease the variance of, of the estimation of the beta amplitude, of course, and tracking the slow fluctuation related to levodopa induced at the, at the synchronization of the beta oscillations. Um, before testing it in vivo, of course, we tested it in, uh, in vitro, and uh, we tested in particular the, how the algorithm for processing was able to uh, follow this kind of fluctuations with a, a certain time constant. By using this algorithm, we First, uh, did a, a pilot study in a uh, 10 patient in which uh, during two hours, the patient started in not condition then took levodopa medication. And uh, first we tested the, the uh, feasibility uh, under a technological point of view, was the external prototype able to follow uh, beta power fluctuations. And then we also evaluated the clinical state of the patient what we found using this such simple um, strategy for adaptive stimulation was a, a decrease in the dyskinesia during uh, on condition during the peak dose and uh, a large decrease of the total energy electrical energy delivered to the patients and this was the first study lasting two hours then we moved to eight hour to try again to understand the feasibility of such a technique and what we do in this case was to compare a day without stimulation, but only medication, levodopa medication, and the second day in which uh, we apply both levodopa medication and adaptive brain stimulation. On average, what we found is that the beta band power in day one had much more uh, fluctuations during the day. During the day one compared to, to the day two. And in the same way, this happens. Now the green line is day one and the blue line is the gray, the day two. This, this thing, the same thing happened also in the clinical state of the patients. Uh, and of course, in, uh, on average, the amplitude of the voltage of the stimulation was less, of course, during the peak dose rather than on the hand dose. And this for us was uh, another um, proof of feasibility. All, both of these studies have been conducted in a, um, in a perioperative uh, experimental sessions. That means that uh, there is a bias in the evaluation of the clinical state because of the standard effect related to the implantation of the DBS uh, electrode. Now, I provide you uh, a, an alternative uh, example of another study that, that you probably know is uh, uh, the studies uh, uh, the Oxford group of uh, Professor Peter Brown and uh, which applied a different algorithm and I will use this uh, example for give you a sense of what does it mean uh, uh, changing the processing technique and the closed group algorithm and how it impacts on the final on the clinical question that you have and uh, 
the, and the final results. In this case, the algorithm is really similar because it's based on the processing uh, local field potential, which is artifact free, and uh, filtering around the data peak, the information, provide the rectification for extracting the amplitude and smoothing the amplitude. But in this case, the smoothing of the amplitude is uh, uh, with a moving average of uh, 400 milliseconds. That means that what you track at the end is not a long-term fluctuation of the beta power, but uh, is faster fluctuation. And then uh, in this algorithm, they apply a pressure for triggering on and off the stimulation based on the overcoming of this threshold of a specific beta uh, power band. But uh, there is this interesting paper of this year, that was meet at all in 2020, in which they analyze exactly what uh, I was telling you to slide four, that the, the processing method strongly impacts the final result and the interpretation of the data in terms of the physiological questions that you have. So all these methods for extracting the beta amplitude are based on two main steps. One is restricting the signal in the frequency domain or in the time domain. Then you have to extract the amplitude by, uh, uh, by calculating the module or by doing rectification and by doing a certain kind of smoothing for uh, reducing, of course, the variance and the noise of the estimation. And what they did in this paper was to uh, try these different algorithms on uh, a synthetic signal created by, the, by adding uh, beta bars to an uh, one over f noise. One over f noise is a, a simplification of what is the neural noise, which is in the background of oscillatory activities. And uh, what they found is that based on the specific algorithm that actually do the same thing, windowing and rectifying, um, uh, leads to different results in terms of interpretations of the burst rate, burst duration, burst amplitude. So that because we have not an a priori knowledge of what is a pathological definition of burst or not, when we select a specific uh, algorithm, then we can, yes, compare behavior uh, of different population of the same uh, uh, patient in different condition and uh, having a heuristic view of what is what are the mechanism of action in, uh, in terms of uh, physiological or pathophysiological uh, meaning of the beta bars or beta oscillatory activity itself. But because we don't have an a priori uh, knowledge, the final results is in any case related to the processes method that uh, we are using. And we want to avoid this effect by using long-term uh, average of the beta power, because in that case, even if we don't know at which extent the beta power is pathological or physiological, its estimation is minimally dependent or even independent of the statistic, the processing method used for extracting that information. So, and let's consider that uh, this result, this difference in the final result uh, has been taken on a synthetic signal, but in the, in the real application, we have a lot of aggressors uh, in the signal because there is not only the simulation artifact, there is the movement, uh, electrocardiographic uh, artifacts, electromyographic artifacts, noise, um, and uh, also electromagnetic disturbances. Um, so as a first group of concept, we uh, decided to have a, a really robust and reliable approach to the problem. Then another important point when you design a computer interface is how you manage the data. And uh, our work goal uh, with the external device, but also with the IPG is to tracking the physiological behavior of the patient during the day. So 
in this case, we have two possible solutions or storing all the information inside the IPG or transmitting them outside. But when you transmit them outside, the request of power is too high for an implantable device, uh, at least compared to what is in the market. Um, so what we decided to do is was to compress the information. That means uh, transforming time domain data in frequency domain data, storing this frequency domain data inside the embedded memory, and downloading a different time point, maybe uh, one at a day, the embedded information. In this way, we have been able, both in the external device and we will be able in the IPG to track the, um, at least the spectral content of local potential both, for both sides, left and right. And uh, at the same time, we will have, and we have the uh, possibility to stream time domain data up to one hour. And that will provide another useful uh, information to use uh, in order to decode the biosignals. Now, another uh, point that uh, I want to discuss is that when you use a certain technology, is its architecture strongly influences what is the implementation of a closed loop logic. For uh, this is in particularly happen because uh, depending on the hardware, the latency of uh, the reactivity of the algorithm may change drastically. And uh, for example, you may have a microcontroller inside the IPG or the external device that for doing an FFT may take 200 milliseconds and uh, you want to, uh, or for doing a, a, a fear filtering. In that case, you have to consider the computational time inside the information of your closed loop logic in order to translate the final result and interpret it, the final result in a physiological perspective. What is the reaction of the signal to what you are doing is strictly dependent, not only to the logic that you have implemented, but also to the hardware that there is in the background and that takes some time for computation. And um, there are different architectural solutions, everything both the processing and the control policy can be done uh, uh, in a banded way uh, in, the, in the implantable device. And this depends on the technology inside the IPG may take less or more time. And, or maybe you can decide to have a distributed sol uh, solution in which uh, maybe the processing for compressing the data is done uh, in the IPG, but then uh, the compressed data are streamed outside and um, uh, the control policy is implemented on an external platform and uh, or you even may want to stream all the data in the time domain outside and doing the processing of the control policy outside and then come back with the feedback and the change stimulation parameters. If we go from the first solution to the last solution, what we have is that of course the flexibility increase because with an external device, the computational power of the external device of course, it uh, increases. However, however, there are other factors to consider. For example, the power consumption, because stringing the data is, is a really power hungry activity for the IPG. The usability decreases, because if you think that the patient has to use uh, the device, you, and uh, you want to provide this to the patient other uh, technology, other system, like tablet, the bracelet, and everything, uh, you are burdening the usability and the increased difficulties for the patient, which may have also co a cognitive decline to use more technology, more hardware. And then also there is a, a, a more um, a regulatory complexity related to the fact that you are deciding how to change the simulation parameter outside and you are streaming this information through wireless technology. So you have to uh, certified that the outside software and you have to be sure that it, it does not um, imply any risk for the patient and also you have not to lose uh, the wireless connection and you have other and other consideration 
And uh, yes, and finally, the latency in this case, theoretically, uh, as a rule of thumb, should increase. From our side, in Ironica, what we did was to go for a complete embedded solution in the IPG with an interface for streaming out the data, but without closing, closing the loop uh, externally. And uh, we decided to, pro to implement some changes in the external prototype that in the first version implemented everything uh, in the embedded microcontroller. But now what we're doing is to providing a wireless interface to stream the data to uh, a station able to receive the data and transmit and bi-directionally communicate with an external heart in which the algorithm can be implemented through MATLAB or Python. In this case, the flexibility, the flexibility remains high and we does not care anymore about power consumption and usability. First of all, because it's an external device that can be used or during surgery or in the perioperative experimental sessions for long, uh, for a short term. So power consumption is not a problem anymore. And uh, who will use that device? No, not the patient, the device will be used by a clinician uh, or a researcher. And um, finally, uh, also the risk associated for a temporary use is, is less, of course, and the latency will remain the same and has to be um, to take into account when I employ any kind of algorithm. So finally, the takeaway message is that when we move from concept to publication and clinical translation of our idea in the field of brain-computer interface in which we have to deal with such a complex signal, um, there are a lot of factors before having uh, some conclusions on physiological mechanism that, that may strongly impact um, our um, conclusion and our answer to the starting question. And this, this element uh, are the one that I show you and that uh, we approach it in a certain way during our uh, clinical transition process, process. And these are uh, the sense in the processing, the control policy and the design itself. And that they are remaining because uh, I want to know what is the spectral content of the signal recorded with a certain kind of sensing. If there is a loss of information because of blanking and something else, I want to know uh, how, for example, a certain properties of the signal, like the amplitude or the phase, is uh, changed by the application of a certain kind of filtering. Uh, I want to know what is the reactivity, the latency of a contra policy, and uh, I want to know actually how this latency depends on the mathematical uh, side or the technological side and the design, the BCI. So thank you. With this slide, I finish. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, stop share. Do we have any questions for Dr. Mattia? So I can start with a question, um, Mattia. Mm -hmm. So like, how often did you have to revise your technological strategy when dealing with these artifacts? Like, do you think like, how predictable was the whole process for you? Did you feel in the beginning that you understand the problem and you need to work to solve it and then you can solve it? Or was there a lot of try and error involved, like trying something and then finding out a new challenge? Or, you know, like, what was the process for you? Because I feel that um, oftentimes um, it seems that the innovation is almost there, but then we face new challenges. Yes, um, uh, in my experience, um, when I started to work uh, with uh, Lorenzo and Professor Priori, uh, the transition between uh, a big, huge uh, system for recording and the implementation of the external prototype. In that case, we had to uh, shrink uh, the power consumption, the space of the 
um, the recording circuit uh, and uh, provide uh, the same function inside uh, the external platform. And uh, um, the same solution that uh, we found, the same approach we found, uh, with, and Lorenzo found in particular with the uh, bigger external uh, device was uh, at the end, where well, I'm not at the end, still valid on the, um, on the external prototype. So trial, trial by trial, we understood how to manage the problem. And that's why I see that um, uh, the hardware that you develop uh, is really important because uh, uh, maybe one solution that fits all is not uh, available. I, I think that is still not available in the brain computer interface uh, field. I've seen a lot of really elegant work and every every kind of work has uh, its, uh, its uh, pro and its uh, cons. Um, it's really difficult to find something that hollow uh, any uh, a huge flexibility. And uh, I think that uh, all this factor has to be considered when uh, analyzing the data and when consider a certain kind of application. And, and, and from my side, yes, the experience um, on directly in the clinical investigation uh, during my PhD, I had the opportunity to test uh, adaptive uh, the brain stimulation in uh, 40 patients was a fundamental element to understand uh, how to make it work and uh, what are the, the, the challenges that you face. Because uh, theoretically, yes, it can, it can be a low pass filtering, can be blanking, but then when you apply, you have a really uh, to pay attention to what is the factor that maybe is just a resistor that uh, that does not allow you to record the, properly the signal. And so, yes, uh, I think that uh, it requires uh, uh, some some experience to go into the to develop a proper solution. And uh, even if you see. Um, also, maybe big company trying to face this problem have taken almost at the same times uh, of uh, our team and uh, with uh, different uh, I mean, resources at the end. So is um, having the possibility to test everything on, on the patients uh, with the external prototype was a huge advantage for us for accumulating experience and know-how. Uh, I don't hear you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. That was an amazing talk. We have another question on the yeah. open pad. Right. Sorry, now you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, in the rapid development of batteries and energy storage, e.g. car industry, could the adaptive DBS device not co overcome the challenge of power consumption? anytime soon? Why does power consumption remain a problem? Oh, well, well, well. Um, the, the power cons uh, consumption is still a problem. Um, for example, for design uh, of the hardware or the firmware like us, uh, in any case, we have to uh, wait for the evolution in the field uh, and having uh, uh, the technology to apply it inside the HIPG or in, in the external device, in the, but you know, the power constraint in the HIPG, of course, is much more uh, limiting than uh, the external device. And, um, uh, and, um, and the availability of battery with large cap uh, cap capacity is, uh, is not as straightforward even for uh, the industries creating this kind of battery. And uh, also because uh, um, batteries for medical uh, implants and devices have, have to be um, certified uh, for certain property for the safety of the battery itself. And uh, compared to other field of application uh, for battery, for example, is a, is a niche hardware of the market and, and um, big companies creating battery maybe may choose to focus on, on the other markets. And um, in general, the problem with the, the battery consumption is that uh, there is a trade-off between the power consumption and, uh, uh, and the amount of functionalities that you can uh, implement inside uh, the high PG. 
And uh, I think that uh, this limitation will uh, is, uh, is, is, um, is the main limitation in designing uh, IPG together with the space. But the space sometimes can be uh, less uh, uh, a problem because of uh, uh, microelectronic uh, evolution and, and uh, circuits are becoming so always uh, smaller. And um, in general, I see that uh, the problem with the battery also is a, not only a problem for the functionalities that you have to build, but also maybe for the management of the device of the patient. Because when we step from a primary battery to the uh, rechargeable battery, then you have uh, the patient that uh, needs uh, to know how to recharge the system, that have to record, to remind to recharge the system, and uh, you cannot ask the patient maybe to recharge for three hours a day. That's unfeasible, right? And uh, yes, there are such in the case, for example, of uh, a neural link that everybody knows, uh, the recharging uh, is asked to be uh, for an entire night every day. So imagine what the yeah. difficult for the patient to use such a system. So we have always to balance what is the use of the device, what is the uh, clinical target uh, and uh, what is the technology that we use. Maybe sometimes the best technological solution is not the best clinical solution. Yeah, so I would like to add to this um, question that uh, exactly also the uh, border between uh, creating the smallest possible device, creating the longest lasting possible device is always a relative ethical question that you have to develop and to keep the patient in mind. So it's not only a question of uh, absolute number of times you can stimulate or things like that, but rather if you have so and so long with this battery, why wouldn't you, uh, the, and you need a new surgery to replace it. So why, uh, why would you not um, make it bigger so the battery lasts longer, but then you have a, a cert more surgical difficulty or more uh, uh, a higher complication rate maybe or infection rate because of the device being larger. And um, you have to kind of focus whatever you have, even if it's really amazing already what you have, you have to uh, think relatively in terms of the benefit for the patient. And yes, compared to a device you, that you have to charge every day. We are already at a really cool uh, time where uh, p patients run around for three to five years with an IPG and do not have to replace the battery because the batteries are so amazing already. But uh, we cannot simply say, okay, we're going to sacrifice 50% of this battery um, to test whether adaptive stimulation works because of the ethical concern having the asking the patient to get uh, a new battery replacement another surgery in uh, twice as often so it's a very complex discussion that uh, uh, not only uh, relates to like the current state of technology but also always to the relative benefit of the patient and how much we can ask or um, like how we can burden the patient with specific tasks like charging or complication risk with surgery. Yeah, exactly. So are there any more questions? I have an, uh, uh, one more question. So, or uh, you have mentioned the different uh, control and uh, uh, simulation strategies. And I think uh, with Neuronica and Alberto Priori, uh, we had the team that focus more on the longer term state changes of the beta band oscillations. Um, and now Peter Brown, for example, is uh, advocating for uh, faster algorithms because he believes that um, through modulating at the, uh, the beta band activity at the time point where it occurs, uh, that may benefit, have a mechanistic benefit from my perspective, uh, we also have to uh, uh, manage expectations. So what, what do you think, like, where is this moving in, in the whole 
like community, how fast would it be possible to uh, develop a, an algorithm that works as fast as Peter would like, but on the other hand is also reliable. So do you think that's feasible at this time point or is it still something for the future? Well, um, if you, in the hypothesis that you want, for example, start and say, okay, um, I will implement the same uh, fast tracking uh, beta change algorithm as Peter Brown and uh, start with this kind of solution directly in the IPG. Uh, I think that uh, uh, at least you need to have a, a great control of what's happening in the signal and every kind of feedback to realize that what you are um, uh, what you, you are doing is strictly related to the physiological changes of the beta power. And um, because of the really uh, difficult environment uh, in which uh, we work, uh, in which the signal has so many aggressors, and uh, during in the high PG, I'm sure that uh, they will be much more than in, in the standard prototype than uh, with an external uh, platform in general, because the patient is moving, uh, because uh, there is the, uh, the, the art that is pacing, the, the, you, you're moving muscle, and uh, at the end, all of the sources of noise in some way have to be managed. So before uh, implementing such a complex algorithm, we have to uh, find in tuning uh, the, the processing in terms of mathematical capabilities, in terms of computational power, and I think that the idea is to use uh, Maybe um, my approach, my idea for the approach for uh, improving the possible control strategies and not just stopping at uh, uh, long-term fluctuation is to have a success device that have a, a wireless interface for transmitting a raw data. And then people like you that are researchers, that are physicians, uh, will collect this data and see, okay, here there is a movement artifact. How can we manage this movement? And then you maybe talk to me and say, can we uh, use this solution for managing the movement artifact inside your device? Is that feasible or not? And between the interact interaction between uh, engineers and, uh, and, phys and physicians, we may find some new robust uh, technique to, uh, to, to be implemented in, in the device. Because the, the problem is running uh, uh, this kind of uh, of testing and uh, um, evaluate the robustness of something that have to run on the patient chronically in the, in the chronic domain. And so we have to leave the device to the patient. We have to be sure that it works as we think. I'm not even sure about the long-term fluctuation. We will see in the clinical investigation how they work, but this is a, a first step for validating a platform with a certain kind of behavior and uh, validating the platform under the technological point of view, and then the closed loop algorithm for its clinical uh, target, which is in this case is Parkinson. Great. Okay. Yeah, so you're telling me exactly what I want to hear. I'm not sure that <laughs> 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 you're just uh, doing that to please me or <laughs> whether that's your actual strategy. But I completely agree. I think um, what I uh, uh, think is most important now is to manage expectations from researchers, clinicians, patients, and stakeholders. And um, I, I think right now it's very difficult to, on the one hand, uh, uh, tell investors that this is uh, a great technology, but on the other hand, be honest about the struggles and difficulties. And I feel that many people are over-promising and then uh, the community expects a lot and, uh, you know, with the Medtronic Percept right now, more than half of the channels have uh, uh, cardiac artifacts. And Medtronic uh, uh, knew that. And they say, yeah, they don't, they're, not, uh, they're not actually surprised. It's what they announced for researchers. But, uh, of course, the clinician in a, in a, a community hospital did not expect uh, uh, the uh, cardiac artifacts in 50% of the uh, analysis streams. Okay.